All right, y'all. This morning we're going to begin in Matthew 25, 14. Let's all stand. For those of you watching on television, please come visit us at Antioch right here naturally. 1030 Sunday morning. For those of you that are here, we're going to begin in Matthew 25, 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his servants and delivered unto them his goods. Father, we ask you to talk to us today, Lord, through your word. Father, you teach us something that's going to help us to serve you in your kingdom. That, Lord, we would understand that we have a job to do here we don't get saved and just live out our life, but we get saved and go to work for you. And, Father, we ask you to show us that today and how to perform that which is good in your sight. We love you, Lord. We thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your mercy that never runs out. Today, teach us what you'd have us to know in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody be seated. It's a story about a farmer, a rancher, and he had a bunch of servants, and he's going to go off into a big trip, business trip, so he takes his things that he would normally invest, and he leaves them with his hired hands. And unto one he gave five talents, that's, uh, that's uh, like, you know, five dollars, just say, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his servable ability, and straightway he took his journey. You know, God don't ask you to do something you can't do. You're serverable. What, what can you serve God with? Well, you might be called to be a pastor. You might be called to be an evangelist. But then again, you might be called to be a faithful church member that's in that pew every Sunday supporting your local church. Whatever you're good at, that's what God has called you to do. And you know, some people are good witnesses. Boy, they can talk to people. Other people, you never hear them say a word. They sit there and you never know they're there. But they're a prayer warrior like you wouldn't believe. You all got a talent that God has given you. Funny how that's a talent like it says here, you know. You've all got an ability, but it's a serverable ability. It's what God calls you for. Not everybody can get up like a luge and play an instrument and sing, but that's his calling, not yours. Your calling might be something totally different. You might be a shoulder to cry on. That's your talent. You might be a person that gives words of encouragement when people are down and depressed. But I promise you, if you search your heart, you'll find a talent that God has invested in you, just like he did here. Well, then he that received the five talents went and traded with the same and made other five talents. This guy doubled his money. He took it, and maybe he went and bought a bunch of turnip seeds and planted a crop of turnips, who's to say, and... Man, he doubled his money. Likewise, he that had two, he gained two other. But he that received one went and digged in the earth, and he hid his Lord's money. How many of us are hiding the talent that God gave you? Well, I can understand it in a world today, in America today, if they find out you're a Christian, everybody hates you. If you're a politician, they find out you believe in Jesus. I was so disappointed the other night. I, I went to a thing, a graduation, and they got up and they prayed, and at the end of the prayer, they said, amen. It's getting where people won't say Jesus no more. It's like they're scared they're going to be made fun of, or, or maybe a Muslim won't like it, or a Buddhist won't like it. Folks, Jesus. I, I, I leaned over and told my, my son, I said, that was a useless prayer. Just, been, just soon prayed to a cardboard box. If you don't use the name of Jesus, there's only one mediator between us and God. That's Jesus. But, boy, today they hiding their talents. But, you know, folks, you look at this right here. He hid his Lord's money. <laughs> After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoned with them. Well, they come to try to do business, find out what they made for him, or if they lost money. Well, if they had invested and lost, they probably wouldn't have been mad. At least they tried. A lot of times we don't want to witness to somebody. I don't know what to say. Well, why don't you try it? You know, you can't do no harm if you try to help someone. So he that received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. Whoa. His Lord said unto him, Well done. Boy, look at that capital. Boy, he's excited. He's so pleased. I want God to be that way with you and I. 
one day when we stand before God and we reckon with God, I want God to look at us and say, well done. You can see the pride in this. Thou, thou good and faithful servant, thou hast been faithful over just a few things I gave you there, he said. But I'm going to make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. You know, it's so good. You know, God gives us this little bit here on earth and says, now you have life. Go out and do something with it. You got the ability to make a living. You got health. Most of all, you got the Son of God. Do something with it. Don't live your life like a snail or a blowfly. Do something for God and make a difference in this world. And God will make you ruler over, well, we can't even understand what he'll make us ruler over. We're going to be joint heirs with Christ in heaven, folks. So, you know what? I tell you, serve God. You'll never regret it. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me these two little talents here. And you know what I did? Behold, I've gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'm going to make you ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. You know, folks, make no mistake about it. Everything you do for God is put down in a scroll. And one day you're going to walk through them big old pearly gates on a street of solid gold. And heaven is so wonderful. In this case, for the workers, he don't call it heaven. He calls it the joy of the Lord. Now that's got to be a good place. How much joy could the Lord give you? And what is better than joy? After all, that's all we all want is to be happy. But joy is a step above happy. You could be happy on a roller coaster. Not me, but maybe you would. But I'd be in a nightmare. I don't like that kind of stuff. But joy is something that's in here. When you go to bed at night, you have a smile on your face because you got joy in your heart. And that can only come from being right with God. Then he went to him that received one talent, and he came and he said, Lord, I knew that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strode. I was afraid. Folks, that's the downfall right there. You're not supposed to live a life of fear. And for that word fear, you can put negativity there, pessimistic. We're not to be a negative people. We're not to be pessimistic people. We're not to be afraid all the time. Me and James was just talking about this. You know, they're talking about we're fixing to have a food shortage, folks. The people think this is a joke, but in about nine months, we're going to start seeing something. But we're not supposed to be afraid because you're a child of God, and Jesus said, you just do what you're supposed to do. I'll make sure your belly's full. Just like the birds of the air. They don't work. They don't toil, spin, but God feeds them. Put your faith in God. Now, if God tells you, like Joseph, to go stock up on flour and rice, then do what God says. You know, a lot of people say, oh, no, I've got to have faith. Well, that is faith. You believe God's telling you to prepare, and you go get prepared. That's what Joseph did, and he saved the world. Egypt would have starved to death. It wouldn't have been for Joseph. But God showed him in a dream. There was, was it seven years of bad coming? We had seven years of good first. He said, we're going to put it up and save it. When there's seven years of bad come, we'll be prepared. God prepares his children, folks. You know, I was afraid. And I went and I hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. Man, his Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant. You know that I reap where I don't sow, and I gather where I have not strewed. You ought to therefore have put my money to the exchangers, that then at my coming I should have received my own with usury. He said, man, you could at least went and bought a CD or put it in a bank. Well, when I got back, I'd at least have some kind of little benefit, some kind of little lanyop off of my money. But I come, I have no interest coming. I have nothing. You just let my money stay stagnant. Folks, you cannot take the gifts of God and let them lie stagnant. God has given you a brain. Use it to read the Bible and understand it and help people. God has given you the physical ability. Get out and work for God. Get up on Sunday morning and come to church. 
Not to mention God gave us a church. You know, in a lot of countries, they don't have one. In China, you're not even allowed to have a Bible. God has given you and I so much. Now, my question to me and you is, are we using it? Or did we just bury it in the ground and wait for our Lord to come back and get on us? There you should have used it and gave it. And to, and it anyway, it goes on, he says, Take there therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which has ten. For everyone that hath shall be given, and he shall have an abundance. You know something, folks? You got life. You got a brain. Now, if you have Jesus, you're going to live life abundantly. A good life. Oh, it might not always be a bowl of cherries. But I'm going to tell you something I've learned a long time ago. Even when us Christians go through grievous times, hard times, it's still a good life. Because we're just getting closer to God and learning how much we need him. So it's all a good life. All things work together for good to those that love God. For everyone that hath it shall be given, and he shall have an abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. If you don't invest in Jesus, God gave you and me his son. But if we don't make him our Lord and Savior, the life you're enjoying right now, you will lose that one day. And your very soul will be taken and delivered to a fellow called the devil. It's so important that you and I take the things God gave us and use it to better and enlarge his kingdom. And it's so easy to do. Like Paul says in Philippians 1.21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul had the right attitude. He said, you know, as long as I'm breathing and I'm living, I'm working for Jesus. Now, when I die, that's when I'm going to kick back in glory and I'm going to enjoy all the fruit of my labor. Right now, I'm tired, I'm hungry, I'm wounded, but I'm going to keep working for God until he tells me that's enough. That ought to be our attitude. For, this is Galatians 1.10, do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For yet if I please men, I shouldn't even be a servant of God. You know, folks, we're too busy today in America trying to please people. We're so politically correct. We're so scared to say the wrong thing. And that is so foolish. The truth will never hurt you. The truth will set you free. And today, I tell you, we need to stop worrying about what the world thinks. Hollywood and all Colin Kaepernick and all them God and America haters. We need to quit worrying about what they think. And let's start thinking about, are we pleasing Jesus or not? That's our main concern. Because you may not realize it. But you're an ambassador. You are a representative of Christ. And I know so many times we don't realize it, but people are watching you all the time. It's like that old saying, you might be the Bible that some people read. You might be the only Bible some people read. So be careful with your testimony. Because, you see, you can do something that's nothing. You can do something they do every day. But you're a Christian. If you do it, it's, you're a hypocrite and a phony and a pig. I'll never forget one time I had some people from church, some visitors following me with some church members, and we got to vent into the red light. And it was like a ghost town on Sunday. There wasn't a car on the road, me and them behind me. And I stopped at the red light, and I seen it turn green on the other, you know, it was turning green. So I took off. I just stayed there a second. And the lady told the people in the car, what a hypocrite. Well, a hypocrite is a phony that's acting. Just because I took off before my light turned plum green, that don't make me a hypocrite or a phony. But those lost people, they got to find some reason to bring you down to their level so they don't feel so bad. That's what it boils down to. But my point is they will use anything they can get their meat hooks in to make themselves feel better about their wicked life. Oh, he, he, he. Yeah. You know, just, you know, people tell me all the time, you know, I, I get this all the time. I'll say something, well, sir, your wife said you have cirrhosis of the liver, and, and they really want you to stop drinking a gallon of whiskey every day. And they look at my belly and say, obesity is a sin. Yeah, okay, well, all right. Then. I hope you feel better now. Drink yourself to death. <laughs> By the way, y'all, I'm, I'm down to 225 pounds. Oh, 24, 24 this morning. And I give God the glory, I give him the glory. But uh, I just figured I'd share that with y'all. 
You know, folks, you are an amb ambassador. You represent Jesus. And it's so important that we do a good job at that because 2 Corinthians 5.20, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead. You see this, folks? We're working in Christ. We're for him. Be ye reconciled to God. One thing you and I ought to be focused on and one accord on is getting people to come to God. We don't have to get them to become a Baptist. We just need to get them saved. And you can do that more by the way you live than the way you talk. Oh, you can beat them over the head with the Bible. But when they see something bad, like you may get laid off, but you don't fall all apart. They think, how do they do that? Because they got faith in God. Don't think they don't see you working on that lawnmower in the front yard. And when that bolt don't do just right or don't come off or you break it off and you're throwing tools and cussing, don't think your neighbors don't see that, folks. They see everything. <laughs> Our job is to bring people to Jesus. So therefore, in Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's one of our jobs right there, folks, is not to toot your own horn, not to want to be in a limelight or a pat on the back. Let people see your work for God so they know there are some people that believe in God enough that we'll give him our life. And that's what we're ambassadors over. Let your light shine. Let it shine. And they'll glorify your Father, which is up there in heaven. And the main thing me and you can do in Jude 122, and some having compassion and making a difference. You know, y'all know this about me, but before I got saved, I, I didn't like anybody. But after I got saved, God gave me a love for the human race. And I realized that sometimes people are ugly and mean, but they've got problems. We need to pray for them. And we need to have compassion. And you know something? When you see somebody down and out, and they're really, you know, you know them. They're hardworking people, but something has happened. you got to have some pity on that, man. you got to reach out and try to help. And we was in Lake Charles last week, some crackhead standing on the corner, and people just giving them handfuls of money. Man, you ain't helping nobody when you're doing that. He went that straight out and got him a rock. That's not the way it's supposed to be. You don't stand on a corner and beg and... That's not how it's supposed to be. God, that boy was a healthy young, young man. He wasn't no more than 25 years old. It's work signs everywhere, help wanted. Well, don't be begging on a street corner. Get out there and be productive for God. Work for God so you can tithe and support your church that you might be able to help a neighbor that's down and out or take care of yourself. So I'm having compassion and making a difference. Finally, in 1 Peter 3, 8, be ye of all one mind, having compassion one of another, loving the brethren, and being pitiful and courteous. You know, folks, we need to be of one mind. What does that mean? Well, it means this. I believe Jesus Christ died and rose from the dead. And I believe if you call upon his name, he will save your soul for the asking through faith. I believe that you are complete in Jesus. And that's what we are to all believe. Because if, if I believe that there's a place called hell and Luigi's going to tell people there's no hell, he's a loving God. Well, he and I are in the same church and we're contradicting one another. Of course, Luigi knows better than that and he don't do that. But I'm just saying we are in one accord. But it's important, y'all. And the most important thing about being one accord is we want people to get saved. We want to enlarge the family of God. That is our number one goal. And we ought to work hard for that, y'all. Having compassion. We really got to care about one another and pray for one another and love each other. And you know something? Be pitiful. You see somebody that's going through a hard time and they're tossing and turning all night. Hey, before you go to bed tonight, stop and pray for them and say, Lord, let them rest good tonight. Just have a little pity. I don't want to see nobody suffering. Courteous, it don't hurt to be nice to people. 
1 Peter 1, 22, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure and heart fervently. One thing you and I need to do is be for real. That heart of yours, that heart of mine needs to be pure. What does that mean? Well, it means, brother, I know you've been sick for a while, but I'm going to pray for you. And you've heard me say this a million times. Don't ever say that to somebody if you're not going to do it. I take prayer very seriously. And if I tell you I'm going to be praying for you, you can take it to the bank. I'm going to be praying for you. They had some kid showed up here months and months ago, David. We don't know who he was, a traveler, a stranger, a boy down there. And me and my wife to this day still pray for him daily. I don't even know who he was. i never even seen him again. But when you tell somebody you're going to be praying for them, folks, be fervent about it. Be on fire. Pray for that person like it's your child or someone you love because we are to love everybody. Because, you see, today we got this thing, oh, God bless you. But you can be laid off for six months with a house full of children and you don't even bring them a loaf of bread. This right here is worthless. We got a job to do. And it ain't saying, I'm a Christian. Well, that's part of it. But it goes far beyond that. And listen, listen in James 4, uh, 2.14. What does it profit, my brethren? Though a man says he has faith and has not works, can faith save him? Well, wait a minute. I'd say I got faith. And I'm a God-fearing person, but old Mike here broke both legs, and he can't go to work. And I say, well, God bless you, Mike. Well, how about bringing him a gallon of milk and a couple loaves of bread, maybe, since he can't get up and work? That's what this is saying. You see, folks, I can have faith, but it's dead. It goes nowhere if I don't use it to compel me to help others. If you got faith in Jesus, well, then why ain't you working for him? You claim you got faith in the Bible and it talks about a place called hell, but you're not trying to stop nobody from going there? See, that don't make sense. Having faith can't save your brother, but witnessing to them, telling them about Jesus and bringing them to church, that can get them saved. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, being ye warm and full, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Hey, I could talk the talk all day long, but if you're not helping anybody and you don't care about nobody, your faith is dead. It ain't going nowhere. It ain't helping nobody. It ain't bore so much as one fruit for God. Even so, if it hath not works, it's dead being alone. Now, that ain't talking about it don't save you. It don't, that's not what it's talking about. It, faith will save you. But for that faith to reproduce, you've got to have enough faith to make you work to reproduce another Christian. What's the fruit of an apple tree? An apple. What's the fruit of an orange tree? An orange. What's the fruit of a Christian? Another Christian. In James 2.18, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. I'll show you my faith by my works. Now, you see, <coughs> you don't get no clearer than that. I'll show you my faith because I'm going to get up every Sunday morning and I'm going to come to church because this is where I start my week. And I'm a firm believer. If you start your week off without coming to God's house, Grand Central Station, you're not going to have a good week. But I will say this. You come to church on Sunday morning, morning, get your prayers in there, do what you're supposed to do, and God will watch over you. He'll bless you this week, and you'll bear fruit. (laughs) Well, you know, I tell you, I know a lot of people, they've been saved for years, and you never know it because they don't say a word about it. I don't think think you could do that. I know that when I got saved, I couldn't keep it to myself. When I got saved, that was the most wonderful thing ever happened to me, and I wanted to tell everybody whether they wanted to hear it or not. Because it was such a powerful thing in my life. You know, when the apostles and Jesus came to town, everybody was saying, Hosanna in the highest, and they was praising Jesus and all that. And the old Pharisees, they didn't like that. They went up there and they 
told Jesus and the apostles, hey, you tell them all to stop saying that stuff about, about Jesus and saying, hail Messiah and all that. You tell them to stop. And this was his response in Luke 19, 40. He answered and said to them, I tell you, if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. You know, that's how we ought to feel about it. When someone says, you're not supposed to talk about Jesus in the workplace. You're not supposed to talk about prayer at school. But they have weeded us out of everything they can. It's uncouth, politically incorrect to talk about your Lord that saved your soul from a burning hell and has gave us this great nation called America. It's not right to talk about him. Well, I got news for you, folks. If we would be silent, the rocks ought to cry out. What a shame. What a shame. Because I don't want to be a lukewarm Christian. I want to be on fire for Jesus. You know, people tell me, they see me all the time, and they say, I watch you on TV, and love the way you preach, because, boy, you, you really get into it. And I always tell them, because I believe what I'm saying. You know, man, if I start telling you about a hole I found that's got bass that big that'll bite every cast, I'm going to be excited telling you about that story, man. Why? Because I know it's true. I've been catching them. I've been frying them up. Well, it's the same thing about Jesus. I believe every word of this book. And you know what? I did believe it by faith. But after 30 years of being a pastor, I have seen so many miracles, folks. I hate to say it like this, but God has proven himself to me. Man, I've seen dying people healed. I've seen people that were ready to die and we go pray for them and they pass away while we're praying. I've just seen it all. And I know, I know what God can do. And I've got to tell people about it. I'm not a lukewarm Christian. I am on fire for God. And I'm going to stay that way till I assume room temperature, okay? Listen to what this says in Revelation 3.15. I know your works, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wished you was. It's, I would means I wish. I would that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. You know something, folks? That word spew is puke. And when you look it up, and it actually means God said, you're making me sick. When I say your name, I just want to puke it up because you make me sick. And I can't imagine God saying that to me. Ain't nobody wants to hear that from God Almighty. But folks, one day you're going to stand in front of him. And trust me, you're going to want him here. You're going to want to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Because you see, when I got a drink of Jesus, it became a water well in me springing forth. And you know, that as soon as I got saved, I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know nothing. But I started praying, God, use me to go show other people what I've got. I want everybody to have this feeling. And every time I pray, I said, Lord, use me. I didn't even realize what I was praying. But you see, again, I wound up pastor of a church. Folks, I'd never been to college. Well, I mean, I went to Suwella for four years, but that was to be an insulator. I barely made it through high school. But you got to ask yourself, how did I wind up here? Well, I'll tell you how. This is where God wanted me. John 4, 14, and this is why God wanted me in this pulpit. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Oh, folks. When you got saved, you should have been overflowing with the grace of God and how to be saved to everybody you know because you are an example and an ambassador. In Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is what? Your reasonable service. It's not unreasonable for God to ask you and I to live for him and to live like we're his children. Romans 12, 2. This is so important. And be not conformed to this world. Don't let this world mold and shape you. Don't let Hollywood shape you. 
But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Every day remind yourself. Every day when you get out of bed, I am an ambassador for Christ. I am a representative for Christ. And I don't want to be a spot of cancer on the body of Christ. I want to be a shining light. And I want to lift him up. Remind yourself of that every day. And by the way, throw in there the fact you're never going to die. We kind of owe him, don't we? Rem the renewing of your mind. That you may prove that it's what's good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. You know, folks, I know that when you and I, we got saved, we were excited and we were fired up. But after a few years, that fire turned into just a small flame. And a few years later, you kind of got a little bed of embers there. But God knows that and he knows that because the world is constantly throwing cold water on your fire. But according to this Bible, keep your fire burning. You remind yourself every day where you come from and where you're going. Remind yourself every day that the creator of the universe loves you. And you know what? Colossians 2, 6, as you have therefore received Christ, Jesus, the Lord, so walk you in him. Fired up to the beginning, fired up to the end. Rooted and built up in him. Oh, folks, read your Bible and come to church. Established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding therein, be grateful to God with thanksgiving. Be thankful to God for the very air that you breathe. I know, folks, you know when you hear a sermon like this, but Brother Russell, I thought you said we were saved by faith, and you're talking today about works and us working for God. And Well, folks, that's right. We're saved by faith. We're saved by grace. But after that, it's not unreasonable to ask you to show others what you got and where you got it. And that's why I'll remind you with the word of God, <coughs> Ephesians 2.8, it's for by grace you're saved and it's through faith. It ain't of yourselves. It's a gift of God. It's not of works. Your salvation did not come to you from working for it, lest any man should boast. Nobody's going to brag and say, God owes me a place in heaven. No, no, no. By grace, that means you didn't deserve it at any time, nor you never will. God gave you eternal life because you asked for it and you believed in him. You didn't earn it. You didn't buy it. He bought it with coins of pain on that cross to give to you. And you are his craftsmanship. You know something, folks? Let me read this verse, and I'm going to talk about this in Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. That word unto means for, for the purpose of good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You know what? Me and George, we're big in planting gardens and all that kind of stuff, and we take a lot of pride in it. Well, I love to pick a great big old tomato, you know, and bring it to somebody and say, hey, I grew that, you know. Well, one year, man, I planted some turnips around my hog pen. And them turnips was that big. I mean, they were beautiful, man. I brought them up here for the white elephant party. I think Andrew wound up with them. And uh, old Garden seen them turnips. said, you didn't grow that. And I admit, I'd never seen turnips that pretty, you know. I said, man, I did grow them. He, looked, he could tell I was telling the truth. I said, I planted them around that hog pen, you know. But just to say, I take pride in what I grow. I like to show it off. And somebody that builds houses, and they're they proud of that house they built. Or whatever you do, you take pride in your work. And at the end of the day, even if you mow the yard, at the end of the day, you just look at it. Boy, it's so pretty what you got accomplished. Well, folks, God's working with you. You are his fruit. You are his garden. And God wants to show off his tomatoes. Unfortunately, a few of us have been bit by stink bugs. We got some rotten spots on us. We need to be picked and thrown to the hogs. Be a good tomato for God. Amen. And you know what I'm talking about by saying that. That's not confusing. Some people say, that nut was talking about tomatoes all of a sudden. No, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Whatever you do for God, make him proud in your performance. Amen. Therefore, said he unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore that the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. You know, folks, God says, I got a lot of work to do, but I don't have many people helping me. 
Why don't you and I step up and say, Lord, here I am, send me. Because you see, he's praying, Lord, send some workers. Well, you and I got to step up and say, hey, I'm a worker and I'm ready to go. Send me, God. You know, folks, if you don't tell people how to get saved, they're not going to. Why do you think they're working so hard to get prayer and Jesus out of the schools? Because by that, every child was being exposed to the gospel. Now, they're being indoctrinated and brainwashed and desensitized, and they're turning our children into monsters in America. And you better listen to what I'm saying. I've been watching this a lot. Parents are beside them, so their kids come home and, Daddy, I'm ashamed to be an American. We're horrible people. And What? Mama, did you know Christians, when they came here as pilgrims, killed all the Indians and murdered them? That's what they're teaching our kids. And if you're a white person, well, you're a suppressor. And if you're a black child, well, you're just too stupid to ever amount to anything. That's what they're teaching our kids. And I'm totally against that. You need to get the race baloney out. Any child can be anything it wants to be if he's got Jesus. I don't care if you're Hispanic or whatever you are. If Jesus is your Lord, you can be what you want to be and you can have what you want to have. I tell these young kids all the time, you know what? If more than anything in the world, you want a Corvette, a brand new, and you can have that. If you make up your mind, you're going to learn in school and get good grades and you're going to get out of school and get a good job and you're going to be fruitful and economically wise and you're going to save you money, you can have that brand new Corvette. There's nothing you can't do or have if you've got God, what do you say? Life more abundantly. But I'm going to tell you folks, today, we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing as Christians. That's why the earth is rotting before our feet. And it's a sad thing. You know, I, I see a lot of these young people today, I talk to them, and they tell me that they meditate a lot. Well, what do you mean? Well, in yoga, you know, in yoga. Well, let me just tell you something real quick about yoga. And I'm not talking about strawberry yogurt. I'm talking about a, a religion from the East. Yoga, the word yoga comes from yoking. And when you stand there, um, and all that stupid stuff, you're becoming one with the gods of the East, yoking together. I just did for the exercise. Well, you know what I told my granddaughter? Why don't you get on your yoking pattern there and talk to Jesus. Instead of wasting time with a mmm, talk to Jesus. And if you want to do some exercises, ask him to help you do them. I do. Believe it or not, I do exercise. And when I do, I always pray first and say, Lord, help me not to break my back. I'm old and brittle. <laughs> I'm getting brittle. And, uh, boy, I'm shriveling up. I tell you, man, I I don't like getting old. I don't mind telling you that one bit. Oh, it's a golden years, man. Ain't nothing gold about it. Every, everything hurts. I get tired. I get seven o'clock. I'm so sleepy. I'm unconscious in that recliner. It's, it's just sad. You know something? And it's the truth that Scott can tell you sitting right there. I've seen rainy, cold nights at 1030 at night. He called me. Hey, man, I heard the shrimp are running. Man, we load up our boats and rah, we're going down in the marsh in the middle of the night and pouring down freezing rain. Never even thought twice about it, did we? You know that to me right now, you'd have to have an ambulance at the boat launch to take me to the emergency room. Folks, time for us to go to work for God. We're living in the last days. We're running out of time. If you've got loved ones, you better start showing them how to get saved. And you make sure you are saved. And go to work for God. Amen? Let's pray. Father in glory, we just thank you so much for your holy word. Thank you, Lord, that you give us a job to do, but you also give us the equipment to do the job. Father, we can't thank you enough for this little church where we come and get fed and get our spiritual exercise every Sunday. But, Father, more than anything, we thank you for sending Jesus, your son, to give us eternal life and show us mercy and give us that life abundant. I pray, Father, if there's one that's lost and they're hearing this message, that they'll get on their knees right now and give their heart to Jesus through faith. Father, bless us all and give us the ability to work for you. And give us the desire to work for you and have compassion 
and make a difference in this world of darkness. We can't thank you enough, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Everyone, please stand. Yeah.